Hey traders, welcome back to another video here on Sunday. Every Sunday what I do is I go through uh, a list of charts and things that I'm looking at myself for trading setups and ideas. We'll be taking a look at things like gold, we'll look at the indices, we'll look at some currencies, uh, a little bit of everything on this channel. And uh, as we get started, if you would just hit that thumbs up button, it helps me out to get this video out to more traders who are looking for serious, real, transparent stuff on YouTube. No Lambos, no lifestyle, that sort of thing. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, first of all, I actually want to start today with the S&P 500 and talk a little bit about what we saw here. Now, if you've been watching my videos recently, you know I've been talking about this a lot, like the S&P specifically. And it's because it is a really uh, powerful barometer for risk sentiment in the markets. And what I mean by that is that if uh, investors or traders are feeling very optimistic, we usually see this thing chugging along. But if markets get a little creeped out, we start to see what we've seen recently, which is a bit of a pullback and arguably for some, uh, the beginnings of something bigger in terms of a, uh, a market correction or sell-off, whatever you'd like to, to look for. In my opinion here, we are still in the scope of a pullback. Uh, now, in terms of traditional logic, usually uh, a 10% uh, drop in the S&P 500 is considered a correction. So we are still in the realm of pullback here. Uh, and with this last few days of trading, I have to give it to the bulls. This is really impressive stuff. What you can see is we found a low around 49.50, and then we put in this very key higher low uh, and shot up here from there. Now. What has caused this? Well, it's been an interesting past week and we need to talk about it in order to prepare for this coming week. So there's inflation data, which has been not good, right? Inflation data shows more stickiness, higher for longer, interest rates aren't gonna come down anytime soon. That's what we're getting from the inflation story. So. I think that does justify a bit of a pullback in the market because now you've got concerns about, well, does that mean the Fed is going to hold rates for higher for longer and it's going to cause a recession and you know business, uh, business earnings are going to really struggle? Well, that's the other part that I want to talk about. We're going to put E for earnings. Earnings from some of the big names in the stock market were very, very strong this past week. Google, uh, you know, Microsoft, they put up some really impressive numbers and the market rallied behind it. So if you're looking at the S&P 500 going into this week, we have to give uh, some credit to the bulls here. They were able to break out of this level of resistance that we marked up on the chart. And I've got to say, I'm feeling pretty bullish overall on the indices. Uh, and while I thought we might take out the lows and continue for perhaps getting closer to that 10% mark, it's looking increasingly likely that for now a bottom has been found on the stock market. Now I have my own positions on this that I'll talk about later in the video, but let's move on from this. Uh, technicals, again, look good here. Uh, I would actually say that you know, I'm going to be a buyer of dips uh, with the full awareness that this very well could take out the lows and, you know, continue. But if that happens, I would accept losses. But I'm looking for possible entries, possible trades going into this week and just waiting for some confirmation from the Edge Finder. Real quick, we'll talk about the top setups on the Edge Finder. Feel free to pause the video if that would be beneficial to you. So I don't see any indices in terms of bullish setups. So without the confirmation there, I probably won't be taking any index trades, at least on the momentum trading side. I have taken some options trades, which I'll talk about later in the video. If we flip things around and take a look at the bearish side, we do have some bearish readings here. Uh, Euro dollar, which I'm already short on. We'll talk about that in a moment. We've got the Russell, the Kiwi dollar, pound dollar, Aussie dollar. So here is your updated top setups for the week ahead. Now, if you've never seen this page before, let me just give you a high level overview of what we're looking at. This is the top setups page on the Edge Finder. It is arguably the most important page because what this page does is it is the summary page for all of our scoring system in the edge finder for economic data technical readings and sentiment readings now the edge finder pulls in a bajillion data points and it carefully combs through each point and generates scores for every category for every asset that we track every symbol in the edge finder gets a score now the cool thing here is that you can actually go to bias and you can take out the neutrals and you can essentially sort for top setups here. And if you want to get really particular, I mean, some traders I know in our group who use the edge finder, they will just look for very bullish, very bearish setups. And these are the only ones that they will consider. Now, of course, that limits how many things you can trade. And for me, I usually go for uh, anything that's just not neutral. So this gives me just a narrow watch list that I can look through in terms of my week to week or even day to day trading setups. Now, 
these setups, I want to answer a quick question that I get all the time, which is, you know, are these time frame specific? Like, is this a, a one hour chart or a four hour chart or one day chart? What I want to clear up on that is that the EdgeFinder's top setups uh, are not a time frame specific entry or exit system. This is generally like this is like trying to point out the the weather forecast for some area, right? It's not going to be able to tell you down to the second by second when you know rain is going to happen, but it generally will say, hey, there's a pretty good chance of rain or a uh, pretty good chance of sun sun sunshine, right? Same concept here with the top setups. It's not a time specific uh, idea. It is just generally saying after looking at all this data, we lean this way or we lean that way. And um, so just wanted to clear that up and uh, make sure people are on the same page about that as we've gotten that question a few times recently. And while I'm on the topic, let me just remind you that the Edge Finder sale is coming to a close here as April finishes out. This will be the end of our biggest sale of the entire year. We're celebrating two years since we launched the product. And if you have not already picked up a copy, there's a link down below in the description. And if you use the code YTVIP, like you can see on the screen right now, uh, you can get access to the tool for 40% off, which is our biggest discount of the entire year. So next up, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about where we're at with the gold market. Um, gold has recently cooled off a little bit from its really monumental run. Gold so far this year was actually my biggest personal trade. I ended up closing a profit of around $18,500 trading gold to the long side. If you remember that trade, I'm sure a lot of you guys do. It was a, a really crazy one. I basically bought over here and I sold uh, around this area. So uh, I didn't caps capture the absolute high, but I am feeling pretty good that I've, you know, I've taken profits and I've moved on and I've made money in other areas since that point. Uh, but I am looking for, you know, with gold, some signals. I, I am overall looking to be long on gold. But again, remember, I take setups based on what we see here on the edge finder. And why is gold not getting uh, a reading? Well, it's getting a neutral reading because there's a lot of mixed sentiment when we look at all of our different indicators. And remember, what I'm looking for is confluence across the economic data, technicals, and sentiment in order to give me a general bias. And so with gold right now, I have a neutral bias. I don't have anything there. But I'll take a look at the technicals and then I'll also talk to you about silver where I do have a bias and I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. So if I take a look at the gold technical price here and I drop it down to a four hour time frame, what you can see here is something pretty interesting. We've got just a, a bit of a sideways market. Now I know the bears were super excited by this thinking that you know this is a big drop and that we're just gonna explode lower. But here's the thing, we're still in what I would say is the context of an overall upward trend. I think if bears are really gonna take this thing lower, you probably need to see something like this. You need to see failure below the previous low, you need to see pullbacks get sold into, uh, and then maybe you have something to work with. But for me right now, gold is not something I'm looking to short, it's in fact something more that I'm looking for long opportunities. Uh, it is an election year. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. There's geopolitical tensions all over the world that could cause gold to spike. There's also the potential of bank failures if we do see interest rates remain higher for longer, uh, as higher interest rates do negatively impact some of the more sensitive um, you know, banks out there. So again, we will continue to watch that. But for now, gold is kind of sidelined for me. Now, that being said, I'm very active on silver. I do actually have a long position already on silver. And you can see that the technical price looks a lot the same, a, a lot alike. But why am I long silver but not gold? Um, well, here is the basic breakdown. If we go back to the edge finder and I show you, let's go to the data scanners. We'll go to commodity scanners and we will say, let's go to silver. Okay. So why are we getting a bullish reading on silver? Well, COT data looks good specifically for silver. When we look at, you know, COT is very long. Uh, overall, we take a look at retail sentiment that doesn't go in our favor, but seasonally it looks good, right? 10 year average for the month of April is about a half a percent gain. Trend is to the upside. Inflation, uh, why is this so positive for, for uh, silver? Well, inflation on the rise is generally speaking pretty good for uh, commodities because again, I'm speaking about industrial commodities that get used in production, manufacturing, right? Um, and silver, it happens to be one of those things. Gold is not so much of an industrial uh, metal like silver, copper, iron ore, things like that. So, um, you know, this is why I kind of prefer with strong economic data that we've been seeing out of the US, I prefer to get long silver over gold. Um, again, we 
could see some of the economic data coming out strong in the US. That is actually in the edge finder. It's calculated to give bullish readings, right? Good jobs numbers are bullish for, uh, for commodities that are used in manufacturing and you know transportation like oil, et cetera. So hopefully that makes sense. So the thought process on silver is I am long. My plan is to stop out if we do break lower, if we fail at the 61.8% retracement from the swing high, uh, swing low to swing high, uh, where we've got this level here, that's gonna be my marker to just go ahead and close the trade for a loss if needed. The NASDAQ also had a pretty impressive recovery this past week, and uh, what you can see is that we had this pretty steep sell-off, but this latest week, with a lot of tech earnings, was able to punch back uh, against the, the bears here. And in fact, we actually kind of have to mark this area here as potential demand, because you can see what we happened here is we put in a low, similar to the S&P, we put in that higher low, arguably, on the lower time frames, and then we closed really decisively above this rejection candle really strong stuff there and not only that we even retested and held this area so i would be lying if i said i'm not impressed with the price action here and it does look like we may have more room to continue to push up now that being said if i'm wrong about that and uh, well i don't have any trades on specifically to the nasdaq in terms of a momentum trade but i do have some uh some swing trades or some position trades on the option sides that i will talk about later in this video so stick around to the end but again nice reaction off of this level i gotta say I'm liking the price action. Uh, the Dow Jones, not quite as impressive. I think you've still kind of struggled to see that, um, you know, a couple days back resistance point break for the, for the Dow. Um, so not really as impressed with the Dow. The Russell also you know, punched a little bit back here, higher low, uh, impressive stuff there. I did actually end up closing my short position uh, for a profit uh, during this, this intraday candle. So I was short right around this area. And when this second candle started coming up here, I had already trailed my stop around this area. So this candle ended up taking me out for a profit. So I made a very small profit on the Russell, but I'm fine with that because again, I, I was really thinking that we would, with the breakout of this, uh, this structure here, which this is where I was short, right? So I was short on this with this big candle. I was like, okay, we might have something here, uh, but I'd like to see follow through. We did not get that follow through. And in fact, we pretty much reversed the full candle. And that was a signal for me to take my profits and walk away. So I think I closed out for, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. And I don't want to just throw out a number, but I know it was more than 500, less than a thousand dollars in terms of uh, profit on the Russell, which is a bit of a bummer. Cause at one point it was up, you know, 2000, 100 bucks or something like that. So, but you know, hindsight is of course 2020 when it comes to trading, you just got to move on and, and find the next trade. The VIX uh, has continued to come down here, which for some of my options trades has been really good. This decreasing volatility as I am an options seller is usually a, a very positive thing for my trading. Um, gold, uh, silver, we already talked about those. Let's talk about oil for a moment. Oil did find a, a bottom, it seems, around the $81 level, which is impressive. Um, we'll see if that one can continue to hold. If you think there's any geopolitical tension that's going to continue to be uh, you know, uh, an issue in the world, I would, I've said this many times on my live streams and some of my videos, but I think if you're a bull on oil, you don't wanna buy into the, the, the you know, breakout of a fear event simply because oftentimes they typically do reverse. And so for me, I like the idea, if you're bullish on oil, to be a buyer on a pullback. And in fact, if we take a look at the current setups in the edge finder, you can see it is getting a neutral reading. Um, though I've made a good bit of money this year on trading oil, uh, this neutral reading is going to keep me out of the game for now. And I did mention that I have a Euro dollar short position on. I'll show you guys here, this is what it's looking like. You can see it's just barely in the red now. Um, you know, actually it was a lot more in the red earlier in the week. Uh, you can see I've shorted it on this candle here and my entry timing wasn't great, but I like the idea. I thought we were gonna reject off this 38.2 and continue lower. In fact, we went back and retested the 50% retracement, uh, but now I'm just about break even on the trade and I'm gonna let this one run. If it does break through that previous high, that's gonna be a signal for me to take a loss on this one. 
But uh, in terms of the Euro, let's talk a little bit about why this might be. And I, I've made this point many times on my channel recently. What we've got here is the top setups page filtered only for uh, the major US dollar currencies. And you can see that the dollar against pretty much everything is getting a favorable read. And this is because, again, a lot of the economic data has been surprising or coming out strong relative to its peers in the United States. So, um, you know, I continue to be uh, willing to, to step up and buy the dollar against peers until this data starts coming out differently. And this is the clarity I want to just point out for a second. A lot of traders have no idea. They're very, they feel very lost about when they should be bullish or bearish on fundamental, uh, on a fundamental level or a macro level in terms of economic data. Again, do not try and do this stuff in your head. It's way too difficult. There's just too many data points. There's too many things to remember. You've got to use software, whether it be ours or someone else's, to help you spot and filter all of the different economic data that there is. We've isolated what we believe to be some of the most important economic pieces like inflation or CPI, retail sales, services, PMI, GDP numbers. We're pulling all this stuff in for our users and making it so that you can easily dissect and uh, kind of interpret whether or not it's impacting a certain currency or commodity or index positively or negatively. Let's have a look now at the commitment of traders data here from the edge finders report as well. What we can see is that the latest data come out uh, that has come out um, is has arrived April 26. So this is just fairly recent data here. Uh, we've still got gold, the Nikkei and uh, oil still up at the top, copper, silver. So again, raw uh, industrial metals still sort of up here high on the commodities list for n overall net positioning. <clears throat> and let me back up and just clarify. This is the um, the commitment of traders data, if you've never heard of this before, this is a way for traders to essentially track and see what institutional money is doing on a weekly basis. Uh, we're the, the COT data is the CFTC's report that is uh, that requires large institutions in the United States to report their holdings on the futures market. And this can be a very powerful indicator for understanding where big money is flowing or not flowing. Um, so these are things that they're more on a longer term basis, short biased on or bearish on. And these things are things that they are more on average bullish on. And uh, you get some stuff in between as well. So <clears throat> this section is, of course, very important. The net positioning standpoint, it gives you a longer term perspective of assets that they're bullish or bearish on. But let me clarify something. And I say this in every video. So if you know my videos well, I apologize for repeating myself. But this is the section of the COT data that you really should focus on. This section is good if you are long term in nature. If you're holding trades for six months to a year, this might be more your kind of cup of tea. But when it comes to, you know, trade Traders, people who are intraday trading or um, using a, a four hour chart or a daily chart, this is going to be your stuff you want to look at because this shows you on a weekly basis where they parked money, where they bought, where they sold most recently. You know, if you know somebody um, who had, let, let's just paint a picture. Let's say you knew somebody who had, um, you know, a very large trading account or investing account, and they had stocks and gold and bonds in it. And they told you, you know, hey, yeah, I've got 60% in stocks and 40% in um, bonds. And you heard that and you said, okay. And then you ask them for every single week after that, where, what's your proportion? And they just keep saying 60, 40, 60, 40, 60, 40. That's not very useful information information if you're a trader because there's no changes. But if you heard from that trader, that investor, hey, you know, I sold a significant amount of my gold position, I'm sorry, my stock uh, positions to buy gold, that across a, a large scope of big institutional money, which is the COT data, is incredibly useful information. So that's why I always point traders to look at the latest weekly filing table that we've built on the edge finder, which is specifically and, and not very other, I don't know any other places that break it down like this so that you can see all of the data the way we've got it here, uh, piece by piece. So whether you trade gold, um, commodities, you know, indices, whatever, uh, we've got it all pulled in here for you. So we can take a look at a couple of the top net changes here. And this is uh, the column that we sort this by is the net change column. This shows you week over week how much money shifted in that uh, that kind of quote unquote kind of theoretical aggregated portfolio of institutional money. So Nikkei, they bought a lot of Nikkei. That's interesting. Copper and silver, they bought some. Czar, Aussie dollar, dollar. They bought a little bit. Um, the CAD, the Russell, 10-year <clears throat> bonds. 
Bitcoin, SPX, and gold was about flat week over week. They didn't really change much on average. Um, on the sell side, oil, NASDAQ, uh, yen, euro, platinum, Swiss franc, US 30, and pound. Um, so let me just also point out that a lot of times traders will take this as the holy grail. They'll just say, oh, I'm just simply going to track institutional money. But please note, the COT data is delayed by a few days. It doesn't mean that it's not useful, but if you're going to make all your decisions based on trades that they might have done several days ago, uh, be careful. This is more, in my view, just a single indicator that we use in combination with everything else in our systematic approach with the edge finder, right? It is one of many indicators. It is useful to get an idea of where they are going with their money, but it is not the holy grail and it's not minute to minute to see what exactly what traders are doing. So please be very aware. Uh, this is a very powerful indicator, but it's not the holy grail and nothing is in the entire world. So, you know, just to, not to get people too excited about this stuff, it is very useful information, but take it with a grain of salt, just like any other data point uh, that we come across on these videos. So that's the latest COT data. And, and if we also want to, there's a cool thing you can do if you have the edge finder, if you want to track things that are most, you know, interesting on the COT, you can filter by COT here. And you can see the uh, certain markets that basically have really seen a lot of buying from institutional money in our scoring system. Or if you flip it around, here are a lot of things that are selling by COT data. Uh, for EdgeMinder users, you can filter things specifically uh, to where you wanna go with that. Also, I know I'm spending a lot of time showcasing the EdgeFinder today. Let me just, uh, again, remind you, this sale is ending and final call on this. This is the biggest discount that we do all year long. We have plans to raise prices and launch new features, but EdgeFinder users who already have it get those uh, for free. So. Do not miss out, take advantage, and uh, again, all the information for it is linked down below in the description of this video. And now as promised, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my options trades that I am currently in. Um, had a really good week in terms of options trading. It really turned around for me, so I'm gonna show you a couple trades that I took. Uh, so I ended up taking a XLC position. Now, you'll see here down on the bottom right that the open P&L looks terrible, but Please note that when options markets are closed, and I am filming this when the market is closed, um, they can give you some really wonky price quotes. So just ignore that, to be honest. Uh, what we see here is that I sold a put on XLC expired on Friday. So um, what that means is I sold the put, meaning I, I basically would like this market to go up. And we did get a very nice pop and ended up capturing the full premium. So I sold this put um, again for, for let's actually go look, we'll show you the positioning here. So if I go over here to XLC, I sold this put for 75 cents and I'll do some quick math and show you how much profit I actually made on this one. So I sold the put for 75 cents per share. So 75 cents per share. I did seven contracts. So that is 700 shares. I ended up making $525 for selling that put which is not bad, we'll take that profit all day long. So I, I made $525 on this XLC trade. Uh, basically, I believed the market had started to look oversold and uh, basically with this big pop back, thanks to uh, Google's really remarkable earnings, XLC, which is the communication services ETF, right? These are your Metas and your Googles and your Verizons and AT&Ts. Those companies bounced back, the stock market itself bounced back this week and this really helped out with my uh, my put that I sold on this this move. TLT, this one not so pretty. I have a position on this one that's gone against me. I sold puts at uh, $93 or 90, yeah, $93 a share. So I ended up getting assigned um, and I've been floating this position for some time. You can see I do have an open loss on this. I've also sold calls though, and that selling of calls is also, you know, uh, helping to buffer a little bit of the P&L on this one. If I take a look at XLY, this is one that closed out on Friday, and this is kind of a crazy one because, again, if you understand the basics of option selling, I sold a put for 175 on uh, that, that expired on Friday. What that means is that we're trading above that as of the market close, so I do not have to do anything. I got the full premium, and I did not have to buy the shares. Now remember, when you're selling a put, you're selling someone else the right out there to buy a put, which gives them the right to sell you the shares at, 90, uh, at $175 per share at any given time during the options contract. So obviously, they could have done 
done it over here, they would have made more money, but the market bounced back. They didn't sell their position or, or close their put. Uh, so in that case, I just simply collected the full premium and ended up making a nice little profit there. I'll show you on this one when we get our calculator out here again, what are we looking at? We are looking at XLY. Um, this one, I sold it for $1.36. And how many shares did I do it on? I did 10 contracts, so 1,000 shares. So this ended up being a $1,360 profit that I closed out and I didn't have to do anything. Well, I didn't even close out, I didn't even do anything. I sold the put, the put uh, expired worthless because it expired above the strike price. And so I made 1,300 bucks on this one. I also just wanna pause really quick. If you're interested in trading options yourself or learning more about them, there is a link down below in the description. Options have become a key component to helping to smoothen out my equity curve with my momentum trading style. Between the two things here, I've really smoothened out my equity curve. It's been amazing because options, the way I trade them uh, is relatively low risk. I play diversified ETFs that I really like and wouldn't mind holding in my portfolio. And uh, the win rate is very, very high. So I win most of my trades. I would say somewhere around the neighborhood of 75% of my trades are just straight profit. And then 25% of the time I have to deal with a losing position. Uh, but again, my full strategy is available on YouTube for free. If you search up Trader Nick Wheel Strategy, you can find my full option strategy. And if you look down below in the description, you can find the broker that I'm using, which is Webull. It's a remarkable platform for options trading for US, UK, and I believe Singapore and uh, Philippines, I believe there's a couple other countries. Anyways, you can check out the broker link in the description down below. That is a referral link. If you choose to use it, you'll be helping out my channel and I very much appreciate it. Also, there's other brokers. I should mention this. Um, there's other brokers linked down below in the description. If you're looking to trade CFDs or Forex in the United States, whatever you're trying to trade, check those brokers down below in the description. They all have special sign up perks for you guys as subscribers. We've worked out some special uh, perks there for you. Also, we'll just go through, you can, I'm not gonna go through every single trade here just because there's a lot that I'm currently doing, but uh, one trade was a little bit more interesting than the others. XLK, right into the close, actually closed below my strike price. So what happens in this case? So you can see the expiration date on this one, XLK is, by the way, it's a technology ETF, and uh, this is going to be all your you know, name brand giant companies that are technology related, like Nvidia, Microsoft, et cetera. So XLK is a company or a ETF that I wouldn't mind owning a position in. It's kind of similar to the NASDAQ, really. So I sold puts on this one, and the market came all the way down and rallied back, but technically closed below my strike price of $200 per share. I sold 1,000 shares or 10 contracts uh, of puts here on XLK and it closed below. What happens in this situation? Well, I still collect the full premium and I'll show you, let's calculate how much premium I, I, I made here. So um, if I go back to, let's pull up calculator again. So we'll go calculator and let's say XLK, we can say, okay, let's go for $1.10. We made uh, $1.10, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, $1.10 times 1,000 shares, because I did 10 contracts. So 1,000 shares, $1,100 in profit that I have collected. Now I still made this, even though the price uh, came down and closed underneath my strike price on expiration day, I still collect the $1,100. But instead, what I get out of this is when I get assigned these shares on Monday, I will get assigned the $200 strike price minus the premium that I collected. So I will actually collect or actually will get assigned at $198.90 on the price. So I will actually be 198.90, I will immediately be in profit on my position because I got assigned right here, right? So even though uh, the strike price is 200, with my premium factored in, my average cost for these shares will be 
90. So I'll actually be immediately in profit and I can hold on to these shares or I could um, sell them or I could even wait until they start to move higher and then sell what is called a covered call or a call. I could sell a call against a position that I have uh, shares in. So if I have 1000 shares, I can then sell calls against my position if the market starts to rally. So I may choose to do that. I'll be watching the chart. I'd like to see if I am gonna do that. I'd like to see this thing uh, kind of go overbought. So if we start to see an overbought reading here on my simple indicators and things like that, I wouldn't mind selling some calls on that one as well. Hopefully this was informative. If you like the option side, make sure to hit that thumbs up button. And if you made it to the very end of the video, um, let me know, just type uh, I made it to the end in the chat or, or into the comment section and I'll try and heart your comment. Thanks very much guys for watching. Have a great day.